This is a G6PD deficiency. This is the first enzyme deficiency that we're going to take a look at under normal acidic anemia. And we are dealing with, well, hemolytic where you have increased reticocytosis. What is G6PD? It is glucose phosphate dehydrogenase. What, where do you find this enzyme? You find this, well, think about the glycolytic pathway, and I want you to branch off the glycolytic pathway and go into what's known as a hexose monose phosphate shunt, or HMP shunt. This particular shunt, HMP shunt, is responsible for producing your NADPH. So take the P in the pentose phosphate pathway and apply it to what kind of NAD, not NADH, but NADPH. And uh, why do we, in normal physiology, require NADPH or biochemistry? It's the fact that we need NADPH so that we can produce proper amounts of glutathione, right? Glutathione. And what does glutathione do for us? It then allows for us to then properly manage and protect our cells. Why is it so important for the RBC? Well, the RBC requires proper amounts of NADPH and glutathione so it can protect itself against antioxidants, right? Antioxidants. Think about a normal, mature RBC, central pallor, it is naked, has no nucleus, it has no mitochondria. The only method by, it, by which it can truly protect itself is through this HMP shunt. So it is a big deal. Now, something that I wish to bring to your attention about this very important rate-limiting enzyme of your HMP shunt is the fact that the half-life of a normal enzyme here is 62 days. So that's over two months. So what then happens when you have G6PD deficiency? We'll talk about this as being an X-linked recessive disease. And so therefore, a male, such as myself, well, I have no choice, mean to say that if I was to then inherit the X chromosome, and that's where the mutation is, then I obviously will have G6PD deficiency. But what about a female? With a female, maybe one X is the mutated one where the other X is perfectly normal. So therefore, she would have a trait. Are we clear? Now, if there is such a mutation taking place with x sync recessive, then what then happens to the enzyme? Take a look at the half-life here. The normal 62 drops all the way down to 13. That's not a lot of time for an enzyme to uh, remain active in one's body. Now, let's talk about the uh, pentose phosphate pathway in greater detail. You focus upon the fact that you're producing NADPH for the RBC. Why do you require that NADPH? So that you can produce the all-important glutathione. What about that glutathione? What kind of issues do you want to know about this? Well, glutathione not only protects the RBC, but if you remember correctly, uh, what's one of the common causes of uh, liver transplant in adolescents and young adult? The, one of the most common causes is acetaminophen poisoning or Tylenol. And so, therefore, don't you require proper amounts of glutathione in the liver in zone 3 so that you can then metabolize and detoxify uh, some of this NAPQI that acetaminophen produces? That's the last time that you saw that. And then you should know about that drug called N-acetylcysteine in which you then replenish the glutathione in patients that hopefully, hopefully, that you can reverse the effects of, of acetaminophen. That's the last time that you saw this clinically. Here it is in the setting of G6PD deficiency. This glutathione repairs the oxidative damage. Now, let's walk through this so that you can clearly understand the clinical picture of a patient that has G6PD deficiency. So now let's say that you have a patient who uh, is from the Mediterranean. Uh, maybe they're Italian, maybe they're, um, uh, they're Lebanese. So in that area, they end, end up consuming, and they do consume quite a bit of fava beans. And so say that you have a patient who has x recessive, who now has been exposed to fava bean. What is a fava bean known as? What do you want to know as a fava bean? For each bean that you take in, think of it as being a free radical. <laughs> okay, so let me have a meal of free radicals. Wow. So say the patient has G6PD deficiency, is introducing bean by bean by bean of uh, free radicals into the body. Hmm. So now what happens? That's oxidative stress, isn't there? And now the RBC can protect itself effectively against the free radical that's being introduced to the body. Mm. So now what happens? What does that RBC contain? No nucleus, no mitochondria, but a heck of a lot of hemoglobin. 
So what happens with this free radical damage or oxidative damage? Give me another one. How about if you're going to the Caribbean or you're going to someplace tropical, shall we say? Maybe perhaps you're taking anti-malarial drugs. Those are oxidative stresses and free radicals that you're introducing to the body. So let it be fava beans. I'll give you another one here, such as chloroquine and company. And so these are the free radicals that you're introducing to the body. And when you do so, the hemoglobin within the RBC it will get damaged and it will precipitate. This precipitation of the hemoglobin within the RBC is called a Heinz body, H and H, hemoglobin, precipitation, Heinz body. Hmm. So whenever you have a hemoglobin within RBC, which is unrecognizable, then this RBC unfortunately becomes the enemy. So therefore, in the body, the RBC is, is seen as the antigen. What is that going to do? It's going to attract your phagocytic cell. Here comes a phagocytic cell, and what does it do? It takes a bite out of your RBC. So then you call this RBC what? A bite cell. It literally looks like the RBC has been, has been bitten into. It's amazing. It's amazing. So now with that said, in terms of your question, remember that question that you want to ask yourself for every single anemia? Intra, extra, intra, extra, vascular. Now be careful with G6PD deficiency. If you completely... Bite, 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 like Pac-Man. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't even know if you know what Pac-Man is. It's a game that I used to play when I was young. But if it's back, 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 and it eats completely the RBC, then it's intervascular hemolysis, right? But what if you just had a bite cell? And then maybe that RBC will be taken out of the vasculature and taken to the spleen, and that'll be extravascular. So be very careful with G6PD deficiency because this patient, upon exposure to the oxidative stress, might either have hemoglobinuria or might have significant jaundice. Inter and extra exist both with G6PD deficiency. Let's continue. So what is a Heinz body? H and H. Heinz denatured hemoglobin. What's a bite cell? It is the phagocytic cell that's coming in and taking a bite out of your RBC membrane. And that damaged RBC could either be completely destroyed in the vasculature, intervascular, or commonly taken to the spleen, and so therefore you call that extravascular hemolysis. Now, there's a couple other things that you're going to like about G6PD deficiency as we go through this further because, uh, well, I told you, I'm never just going to give you one disease and walk away from this because you are taking boards. When you take your boards and you're given questions, there are going to be certain things in the in clinical vignette in the question stem that, is, uh, th that you might think of it as being a buzzword, and in your mind you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is G6PD deficiency, no doubt. No, 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 be very, very careful. What I mean is the following. Say that your patient has susceptibility to catalase-positive organisms. Hmm. So as soon as you see catalase-positive organism susceptibility, you probably have gotten into the habit uh, from basic pathology, immunology, of immediately going into chronic granulomatous disease. Do not ever do that from henceforth. Why? How in the world, Dr. Raji, do you bring the differential of chronic and granulomatous disease with G6PD deficiency? What the heck would they even have in common? Guess what? Both of your patients will be susceptible to catalyst-positive organisms. Give me an example. The prototype, of course, you all know, Staph aureus, right? Staphylococcus. Dr. Raj, I'm still not seeing it because um, you're telling me that I'm being susceptible to an infection, but yet we're talking about RBC, a red blood cell. A red blood cell doesn't protect me against bacteria. I, I, I get all that, and you have valid points. I understand. However, what are you not producing in G6PD deficiency? Pay attention. NADPH. Huh. A neutrophil. Jump over to the next cell. Leave the RBC alone. I want you to think neutrophil. Picture it. What does it look like? Oh, segmented lobes, right? And what is a neutrophil responsible for? Good. Phagocyte, phagocytosing or killing bacteria. What's the first enzyme that you require for destruction of your bacteria? Oh, my goodness. It's called NADP. PH oxidase. There you go. So if that enzyme requires NADPH, and what don't you have in G6PD deficiency? Look at the first bullet point. 
you know, of NADPH. Dr. Raj, you're telling me that there are two cells being affected in G6PD deficiency. That's exactly what I'm telling you. You'll have hemolytic anemia and you have catalase positive susceptibility. You will never have that in chronic granulomatous disease. In chronic granulomatous disease, it is only one cell that's being affected, and that is your neutrophil because you're missing the enzyme NADPH oxidase. I hope that's clear. Repeat that a few times so that is clear to you. Amazing, isn't it? Good differential. Do not just jump to conclusions. Read the entire stem because those people that are making the boards, they're in, they know, they know as to how you function. Your job is to get into the minds of people like me, like people who are the question makers, so that you're not fooled. Don't get trapped. Don't let them do that to you. Okay, so let's take a look at our G6PD and a couple of things that are important for us. So here, I want you to move to the left, and I want you to identify glucose here. And then this is the glycolytic pathway. We're going to branch off the uh, glycolytic pathway, and there's my rate-limiting enzyme, G6PD, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. What are you going to form? Look, you took NADP and you form NADPH. What do you actually require that NADPH for? You're going to take oxidized glutathione and you will reduce it. Remember in biochemistry, if you reduce something, what does that mean to you? Oh, yeah, you create the active form. So here's my GSH that is the reduced form of glutathione. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what protects us. That is what protects the RBC. Against whom? Free radicals. What does a free radical mean to you? Oxygen and company. So, for example, remember superoxides? You remember hydrogen peroxide? Which one are we seeing here? That's hydrogen peroxide. That's a free radical. Where did it come from? Take a look at that box. Infections, most commonly. Doesn't that then produce free radicals? Of course. Drugs, such as Remember antimalarial, I told you if you're about to go to a tropical country and you're taking antimalarials for months and months and months, you're introducing free radicals. What was the name of that bean in the Mediterranean that they consume in their diet? The fava bean. So all of these would then be introducing a free radical. That GSH, which is a glutathione, will take the free radical hydrogen peroxide and make it into water, which is completely benign, and it's a neutralizer, isn't it? So imagine, please, that your patient doesn't have G6PD. You're not going to produce NADPH. You don't activate glutathione. Uh Uh-oh, free radical damage. Hmm, what is it going to cause damage to? That hemoglobin. What do you call that hemoglobin now? Heinz body. Who are you going to attract? Phagocytic cell. What do you produce? Bite cells. What was that other thing that I told you? Not only will you have hemolytic anemia, but you also have susceptibility to infection. What kind of organisms? Catalase positive. Everything that we just talked about here is what you're seeing. It's all lined up, x and recessive. And then the last little part that I wish to add is the part on the top, very right, and you find that if you don't have G6PD deficiency, you end up forming your Heinz bodies. In terms of its uh, hemolysis, it could be either intervascular or it could be extravascular. Is that clear? Take a look at that arrow where it says G6PD deficiency. That's important. Intra or extravascular. Both instances occur. What we're looking at here in this picture is your Heinz body. How does this occur? Free radical exposure, fava beans, infections, drugs. What are you going to find next? You're going to find bite cells. G6PD, most common patients, African and Mediterranean descent. That's important. If it's a male, X sync recessive, no choice. We are only given one X. And a female, it could be a trait. Please focus upon episodic, episodic, episodic hemolytic anemia. Why? Because are you going to be, are you going to eating fava beans 24 hours a day? (laughs) No, I hope not. So it's only up after exposure to that free radical is when you have the hemolytic anemia. Is that clear? So you want to be very careful. Know as to how to uh, dissect certain terms. Episodic is huge. So 
When you have episodic hemolytic anemia, you're going to have pallor fatigue and jaundice, infection, oxidized drugs, take a look at these, antimalarial, sulfonamides, nitrofurans, and fava beans. What is this? Population, Mediterranean.